Brandon, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show and talk shop. I know we have a, a, a bunch of topics. And um, first of all, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me on. It's great to see I'm, you. I know. I'm excited to actually catch up with you. We'll just do it uh, on a recording. On a on recording, a right? Line. Exactly. I, I think people probably like that. Anyways, it's more yeah. human, right? I think so. <laughs> um, you know, why don't we just kick off with just giving a, a quick intro because, you know, you have an incredible um, you know, background. You've been in the game a long time. I know we met uh, years ago in, in the Bay Area yep. uh, when I was out there, you know, grinding it out, doing the founder startup thing, you know, just like, God, I just think about it now. I got off a call with um, with a friend of mine who does a lot of coaching for um, for founders and like early stage startups, particularly around sales. And she was just like, man, it's, you know, the founder experience. She reminded me is like the hardest, most stressful thing that I can imagine on planet earth. And, uh, and she's been there and, you know, she's done that. And then she does that a while. So it's, it's a, it's a long journey, but yeah, just a, a little bit about your background. So folks can uh, be introduced yeah. to, your, to your greatness. Absolutely. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, the, the founder journey is definitely uh, yeah one of just kind of constantly waking up and deciding to eat glass uh over and over again <laughs> i think i think elon said that or someone uh and uh yeah it's it's fairly accurate i think most days are are like uh down days most days are like things are breaking or when things are going well it's so good that it's starting to break other things and so um yeah it feels like startups are oftentimes you know 95 percent of things that happen or maybe more than 50% of things are losses and you're just kind of counting those wins and hopefully those wins 10 X, uh, the, the setback. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely, definitely, I'd say like the, the challenge is less technical and more like an emotional challenge, uh, on many days. Um, you know, so I, I just got a plus one that. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. 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 This is, this is my second company, second, uh, B2B SaaS software company. Um, first one was, was focused on, email personalization and doing that at scale. Um, I ran that for about a year and a half. And then we got acquired by a company called Outbound Works, which was a outsourced sales development company. Um, I was there for about a year and a half. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so, so I've, and, and Groundswell is built for salespeople to help them prospect more efficiently, helping with intent signals and specifically with product-led growth companies. So looking at product data, to use as an intent signal. So I've, I've been kind of in and around building products for salespeople and more specifically for prospecting. Um, so SDRs and AEs that prospect. Um, and then, yeah, last thing I mentioned, like before I was an SDR, that's how, that was my first job out of college. Um, I didn't know what that was when I got the job. I think it was called something different, but it was an SDR gig. Yeah. Um, and then I was there for about a year. It was actually miserable. I did not like it at all. Um, and then I joined a, a startup as an SDR in San Francisco, and I loved it. Uh, and it was just the culture was night and day different. Um, and it was also a very high growth company. So I was the first full-time employee, started as an SDR effectively, and then started closing deals. I would kind of onboard them and support them as well. So it was kind of the full full cycle um, and then just over time grew that company um, to about 10 million in revenue and built out the sales team, the SDR and the AE function there um, and ops and, and kind of learned some ops stuff there um, just because I had to. Um, and so that was, I, I say that was like my MBA. Uh, that's that's like where I really learned those those three or four years was like where I really learned how a startup works going from, you know, basically zero in revenue to 10 million in revenue and the first employee to hundred employees, like, that growth trajectory, if somebody's lucky enough to be on, you know, that ride, uh, stay, stay there as long as you can, because you just want to learn as much as you can, um, when there's that sort of trajectory at a company. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been a, a good experience for me. And yeah, I mean, it's just basically been a decade in B2B SaaS. Awesome. Yeah. I remember yeah. Outbound Works, shout out yeah. to Ben and, yeah. uh, and that whole crew over there. Uh, I remember doing a video uh, for, for you guys at the true ventures office. That's right. It yep. was, uh, Lars and a bunch of folks. Cause I think Lars is still involved with, with true ventures. Yep. Um, so yeah, we, we've been at it for a while. It's funny. <laughs> I still have my hair. Although I remember a couple of years ago, the, uh, hair, the, uh, what is it? 
haircut person barber there we go um was telling me i was losing my hair so uh, i don't know it still still looks pretty decent right now yeah you're good the <laughs> well, founder you know, life will do that though right can you like can you imagine that this is my 14th in 22 years 14th venture i've uh, uh, attempted as a as a founder uh it's amazing and it's unbelievable. Well, it tells you that they've they've churned uh, pretty quickly, uh, but I, but that was that hustle culture stuff, right? Where I was just like, no matter what happens, I'm gonna keep going. I remember I was a door to door salesperson in uh, when I was in in college, and I, I thought that was an incredible experience. Don't get me wrong, but I think it also built on healthy habits because mm. like the door to door, at least that culture that organization I was part of was like priding you on how hard you worked. Yep. Right. And it was like, yep. you know, work, 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 work. Like, you know, I, again, we were in our young, you know, age uh, or early twenties. Um, so like burnout was, a was not what it is. I think when you're, I mean, I'm in my forties now. Um, it's just a different, it's a different ball game, but I think like I took that approach. It was like go and drink beer at the bar Yep. you know sleep like you know a couple hours and party you know college right like that whole thing is when i got involved with that and i took that on into my late 20s 30s and i was living like that bro until my late 30s until i i literally you know i would call it had a had a maybe it was a burnout or or like some kind of like midlife crisis where i was like holy shit so you know yeah. i think nowadays can't believe I'm I'm back in the founder seat now because I told myself I wasn't going to do it anymore. But after 14 times, I think now it's like, how do we build sustainable habits, yeah. right? Because as you know, brother, like you, you're you going to pivot a thousand times. You're going to keep yeah. going and your ability, you said it earlier, to, to keep that even keel emotional state is, I think, probably the most important thing because you can't make good decisions, right? When you're just like out of it. Right. Yeah. And and you can't get out of bed or whatever it is, or you're out of bed, but you're just like super overwhelmed. You know, any yeah. tips that you would give founders around that? Yeah. I mean, I, I, uh, I can share a little bit about, about my experience. I think uh, more importantly, like I, I uh, definitely spent a lot of time thinking about reading, studying founders that are, you know, further up on the the ladder, so to speak, than me, you know, further along in their founder journey. Um, and I was actually talking to one, uh, a couple of months ago, maybe a month or two ago. And, and I was kind of sharing this thing of like, man, I've like worked really hard. I had a kid 10 months ago, that kind of changes my perspective a little bit. Um, but like the reality is to build a big, fast growing company, you do have to work very hard. And I was kind of wrestling with this with him and saying like, how do you think about this? This is a, a founder of a company that, um, eight years old, they're a multi-billion dollar company, still private. Um, they will be a very, very large public company. Um, and talking about the CEO there saying, you know, I, I was like, how do I just grind for eight, 10, 12 years, best case scenario? Like, how do you think about putting yourself in that, that mindset? And he was like, I would actually completely flip it. I would say you can't grind because if you want to be around in 12 years, you won't last. And so that was actually really refreshing coming from like literally the 1% of the 1% in terms of companies that have made it, have been successful. This person has worked very, very hard. They have by all metrics succeeded in the startup game that we're playing here. Uh, and he was like, look, you just have to spend time with your kids, with your body. You know, you need to be healthy. Um, you need to be doing things that makes this sustainable. For me, that was like the biggest kind of light bulb moment or weight off my shoulders of like, ah, okay, if he can do it that way and build that massive, you know, a 10 billion plus dollar company, um, and it's going to be a 50 or hundred billion dollar company. Like if, if he can do it that way, then I think anyone can. Um, and so for me, that was very relieving to just hear, you should be completely flipping it. It's not like, how can I grind for eight, 10, 12 years? It's what are the systems? What is the process you can put in place so that you can sustainably build a business and still be the founder and CEO in 12 years? 
that's Love that's it. probably my biggest tip yeah awesome yeah. well why don't we we i feel like we could talk about this topic for for days because i think uh, all founders need to know that and i remember yeah. when i did a documentary series in the bay area a couple of years ago um i was you know kind of traveling around talking to a bunch of founders vcs and i did it overseas too that was the main thing it was like every CEO you talk to had like a meditation practice, had mm -hmm. like some kind of workout routine. They were like, I need that to be able to get in the zone. I think work, remote work can also be a little challenging sometimes as well, because, you know, you're just like um, in your bubble, right? Yep. And um, and I don't know, That's a, I guess that's another topic for another day. day. Yeah, I just had a convo about that too. Yeah, totally. There's there's no in and out of the office. So it, it kind of never turns off, right? And especially with Slack on my phone all day, like I could be exactly. cooking dinner at seven o'clock at night with my wife and kid and see a Slack message and get distracted. And actually, I don't think that's healthy, obviously for my family, but it's also yeah. not healthy for the business. Like you want to unplug. And the, the last thing I say about this is one of my friends, founder friends talks about this as like, you need to treat as a founder, you need to treat yourself as like a professional athlete. So across all, all kind of metrics is like, you know, mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, like all of these things you need to be thinking about deeply. How do you kind of hold yourself to the highest bar? And like rest is an important component of that. Resting at night, taking time off. Like these are kind of cliche things that it's easy, even in the moment I'm like, ah, oh, but like, I got to keep grinding. Like this yeah. is an important season of the company. In reality, like the most important thing you can do is take time off, step away. When you come back, you'll be 10 times more productive. So it's a cheat code to be more productive um, is, is the way that I justify it to myself. You know, and I think that largely, at least from my experience, largely uh, I had been motivated by my own insecurity. You know, I, I, I dove really deep. I mean, I've, I've been doing the founder thing for so long and that the, uh, that, you know, that mindset and, and the last couple of years I started to look internally and realize you know, a lot of my my drive to work super hard and even to be successful historically was was like built on top of my own insecurities as a as a person, feeling my my own self worth and those sort of things. Um, it's crazy for me to say that now because I didn't really think about that. I, I maybe yeah. I didn't have the perspective, but yeah, it stems back to like, you know, me not doing great in high school right or and then getting to college and et cetera, et cetera. and then it was like yep. oh this startup thing oh i can really be validated as a human being and become super successful part of that journey also for me personally is that i i saw like a lot of people become multimillionaires, super rich even billionaires and still be on a quest and it was like ah oh, interesting still yeah. being kind of trying to figure it out. And I was like, all right, well, well, what does that mean? It actually threw me into like a, an existential crisis for a bit because I was like, all right, well, what does that mean? Hold on. My entire existence was like being a startup founder that was successful. Well, if that's not going to do it, then what is? Holy crap. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting thing. And so, you know, I think that 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 is maybe, I don't know, I, I don't want to generalize, but I think that that is maybe a, a rite of passage for a lot of us to get on the other side and say, all right, I'm going to continue to like pursue this thing because, you know, at the end of the day, uh, this is what I've been doing and I feel passionate about building things, um, but being really cognizant of around like not letting it completely define who I am as a human being and that I have other aspects of me as well. Um, I think that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I think it's, it's the reasons are different for everybody, but everybody has a reason or reasons why they're doing the thing that they're doing. And I think, yeah, to, to be cognizant of those reasons, uh, you know, those wirings or upbringing, you know, also just who you are as a person by nature, like it's, it's important. It's still a process for me for sure. Uh, but I think understanding like, you know, am I doing something out of ego? Am I doing something out of fear? Am I doing something, you know, because I have a chip on my shoulder, like all of these things um, are somewhere in all of us. And I think it's a matter of like trying to dig in and do that hard work of figuring out, like identifying, ah, I think I'm like acting out of fear here and like I shouldn't be. Um, and yeah, that's just like a, a matter of spending a lot of time internally. I, I call it like, like walks are probably the best way that I do this. Uh, but I call it like getting to, to 
inbox zero mentally, where you can go through all your thoughts on a daily basis. And you have, you know, your to-do list, you have these, you know, whatever things floating around in there. But eventually, once you get to that inbox zero, what I've found at least is I then have maybe one, maybe two really substantial, like meaningful um, insights mm. uh, if I do, you know, uh, an hour long walk. And that insight is typically something that's like kind of deep inside of me, not like, oh, I need to write this email to this person. It's usually like, oh, I think you're acting this way for a certain reason. And and maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, but just being able to get to the root cause only, I found that it only happens when I get all of the other clutter out of the way. And then I can kind of get to that mental inbox zero, which, you know, ultimately is just meditation as well. I just suck at meditating, should be better at it. I, all of us do right like who, who's the best i think that's the, one of the cool things um yeah. about meditation right eckhart toe i remember reading a book a while ago and he uh I think it was the power of now um and you know he talked about the the uh power of that ego or that pain body uh if if, if you're familiar with the book you understand yeah. that concept yeah. but essentially that ego and it's like the ego can be a tool, should be a tool to be able to use to drive you, but you're in, you're essentially in control of it where you can kind of press the gas or, you know, or take your foot off it when, when needed and it not be the complete driver where you can't actually even see that it's in, in, you know, in play. And so, you know, I think that's really kind of an interesting sort of a way to, to approach it. Right. Yeah. Um, but transitioning into product led sales, I mean, we could talk about the other stuff for a while. Maybe we'll do another one just on that, but I think, you know, what you're doing in product led sales, um, is really awesome. Like what inspired you to, to then start a company solving this? And maybe we can dive into what you're solving as well, because I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's something that, that folks need to know out there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So. Yeah, what what we're trying to do is build tools for uh, any company that is prospecting and trying to set meetings. There's a lot of B two B SaaS companies that are doing this. Um, we think that there's, you know, we've identified up to a couple hundred intent signals. So these are just like reasons to reach out to a certain company, a certain person, when to reach out, and what do you say when you reach out, right? Those are fundamentally the four questions that you're trying to answer when you're prospecting. So what company you're reaching out to? Who at that company, who are the key personas? Um, you know, what's your buying committee look like there? Uh, what is the message that you're sending? And then when are you reaching out? Um, so that's what we're doing is, is aggregating that data. We're starting with what we think is the highest intent signal out of this list of 200, which is who is signing up and using your product, what they're doing in the product or what they're not doing in the product. To me, this is like a very high indicator of a good fit company to go sell into or support or help, you know, if they have questions. And I, I kind of came across this when I was at Zoom um, doing operations and enablement for the BDR org there. Uh, and they do, at, at Zoom, the BDRs sit under marketing. They do net new sales, set up meetings for net new sales, but also upsells and cross sales. Um, and again, you know, they, they had all the best kind of the tech stack that you would imagine, you know, a dozen different tools. Um, and I was helping build out the playbook there and, and basically saying like, okay, how do we prioritize for each rep? You know, there's a hundred BDRs for each of these BDRs. How do we prioritize out of their book of business, which companies to reach out to today? So if you got, if you're an SDR, you're supporting three AEs, each AE has a hundred accounts. So, okay, you've got 300 companies you want to go after. How are you deciding out of those 300? What are the 10 companies that I'm going after this week or however many? And there's all these different signals across all these different tools. And um, so I just started stacking these things up and saying, okay, this is the most important signal. Then here's number two, all the way down to, you know, dozens of these signals. And it, what I realized is there's this treasure trove of data of people signing up and using Zoom. So this is the PLG motion, right? This is part of the magic of PLG is you get a lot of first party intent signal from people signing up for Zoom in this case. Um, but what I realized is it's actually very difficult to give this rich data set to a salesperson to be able to use in their day-to-day -day workflows. 
Um, you can visualize it. We visualize some of this in Tableau and I worked on a, a project to like better visualize this data and it was very effective, this project, um, but it was still limited. We had to work with data science and data engineering to get the right data from this magical place called the data warehouse. Um, it's not in Salesforce where salespeople work or outreach or sales loft or whatever. Um, it's in this technical place. Um, and so that was the, the light bulb moment for me of like, ah, oh, okay, interesting. There's all these intent signals. This one in particular is the highest intent signal, in my opinion. Um, and there's a bunch of data that that now backs that. But then there's all these other signals. And so we we chose to, to go after kind of the wedge into the market is this product data. And we're starting to now expand our offering to include other intent signals outside of just product. But that was kind of the genesis of how I kind of came across this and why we started where we started. Well, let's talk a little bit about product-led sales. Like what is it and what should, you know, revenue leaders out there be sort of looking into, right? Um, yep. You know, especially around being able to start to plan for it and implement for it or decide whether they should pursue this type of strategy uh, altogether. And, you know, we get a lot of pushback from like direct sales organizations or organizations that say, oh, you know, PLG or whatnot, you know, uh, my product, you know, is not sellable that way, or you know, it needs a mm -hmm. salesperson to be able to do that, you know, because it's a larger deal size. Uh, what would you tell those folks? Yeah, definitely. So I, I've I've got a lot of thoughts on this. I'll, I'll share three with you. So number one, I would say just to define it, um, product-led sales is basically just bottom up and top down in combination. So PLG is bottom up. This is where you can sign up on a website and start using the product without talking to anybody. Um, another way to define PLG is just the primary go-to market motion is by having the product be the first thing that somebody interacts with, as opposed to a salesperson doing a demo, for instance. Um, so PLG is just, or product-led sales is just a PLG motion and there's salespeople and you're marrying those two motions together. Um, that requires a lot of data that requires a mindset shift that we can talk about for salespeople. Um, that also requires a lot of cross-departmental organization and opera, opera, operationalization uh, of that data. Um, and so I think that's, th these are like some of the challenges um, when you're trying to operationalize a product-led sales motion. And so um, I'd say also the, so, so to the person that says like, do we need this? First of all, um, just like to dispel any upfront things up front, like PLG does not replace salespeople. Um, PLG is a way for more qualified leads to come into your funnel. I saw this firsthand at Zoom. We had 100 BDRs. There were 1,600 AEs at Zoom. Zoom is a very easy product to just get started as a PLG product. That doesn't mean that they're going to self-serve their way into a hundred thousand or a million dollar contract. That doesn't mean that they're going to run into, you know, uh, red lights or green lights while they're using that process product and need a salesperson to intervene when they hit a red light or a green light. Um, and so PLG, and I've heard this, uh, by the way, from AEs at PLG companies, they say like, literally I'll never sell at a company that's not PLG because you're getting these people that are further down the funnel, they may be using your product for six months or for two years before you talk to them. So you're getting these people that are very familiar with your product. They're already either, you know, they've been using it for a while, maybe they're paying a small amount, but they're not using a certain other product or they're not, you know, they haven't shared it across their whole team. And so I think that's the other thing that, that I would consider is like, when you're, when, you are thinking about setting this up as a business, you do need the buy-in of salespeople. And so you need to make sure that like you're playing nicely with them and making sure that like the, the data and the plays that you're running for self-serve are not cannibalizing their business and vice versa. Um, so that would be the other warning that I would mention. Well, let's talk a little bit about AI, generative AI. You know, <laughs> we can't ignore it at this point, right? <laughs> yeah. um, nor should we. You know, it's it's definitely something that uh, we've thought a lot about uh, just here at on this new venture at Asset Mule, and you know, our <laughs> our domain is dot AI because we you know we we do understand that that um it's uh 
it's going to be something that that's super valuable and that we need to layer on the product. We thought a lot about like, where do we start? Do we just mm -hmm. build AI or do we start to understand kind of the workflows and the pain points uh, that, that, you know, we're solving and then layer on AI on top of it to be able to then take that to another level. Um, yep. So that's kind of how we've thought about it. What's your, you know, sort of opinion? I know you have a new product out as yep. well that focuses on, on, uh, on the, yeah, absolutely. So I, I call me uh, in the camp of like uh, for AI and like very, very bullish on it. Um, I think it's the biggest technological shift in the past decade. I don't think we'll see a bigger technological shift for another decade. Um, so I think it's going to touch everything. Um, I think there's going to be a bunch of AI companies that pop up. I think actually what's more interesting is pretty much every, you know, a vast majority of, of companies are going to start using AI um, in their products. So it's it's less about like a bunch of new AI companies, although that will happen, and more about the proliferation of this technology. Just think about it as a new hammer, a new tool for companies to use. They're going to be able to use this hammer with their existing product. Uh, and so um, I think about it as a product builder, I think about it from the perspective of, you know, what is the job to be done? What are we trying to do? And can this new tool help us do this thing better, faster, whatever? Uh, and so, um, you know, for us, for instance, um, you know, we wanted to build uh, at some point, like we knew, you know, in the next couple of years, we wanted to build models that would sift through a bunch of product data and summarize that data for a salesperson or sift through that data and figure out how to, to score that information or sift through that data, um, you know, and show within the, the kind of signal there, what the rep should use in an email based on, you know, in some cases, hundreds of data points. To me, it's like this, this is ultimately like the job of somebody that's prospecting. This is what they're doing manually, right? They're looking at the CRM data, they're looking at sales engagement, they're looking on LinkedIn, they're looking at a bunch of different text, a bunch of different signals, and then they're summarizing that into just a couple of sentences in an outreach to uh, the person that they're trying to get a meeting with. It turns out that LLMs are very good at doing exactly this, at looking at a ton of text and summarizing that text. And so we just got very lucky that the thing that we were trying to do at Groundswell just literally a hammer fell out of the sky, this new tool. And we were able to, instead of hiring, you know, two or three or four machine learning engineers in a year or two, we were able to pull that forward on a roadmap, plug into open AIs, what we've used. And there's a bunch of different LLMs and different models out there that you can tinker with. Um, but we were able to get a pretty amazing MVP out the door um, very quickly um, and, and fairly cost-effectively. So that would be my number one piece of advice is like, what is the job that you're trying to do? And are LLMs, is generative AI actually well-suited to solve that problem? Like there's a lot of companies and a lot of products that it doesn't um, really help you that much. And so um, that's where it's, you know, you're, you're a solution in search of a problem. That's not a good place to be. You don't want to just be a solution in search of a problem, so a solution being generative AI, trying to find a, a problem. There's a bunch of companies that pop up every day on Product Hunt right now that are like, you know, whatever, some company that they used uh, OpenAI, you know, uh, integration to, to build a product, but it's actually not really solving an important problem. Um, so I think that that would be um, the thing that that's the mental model that I'm using internally at Groundswell. Um, and I think that's, I've heard a lot of smart people say that as well. So um, I think that's the right way to look at it or, or one of the ways to look at it. Well, that makes me feel good because we didn't just go out and start to, you know, build AI just for the sake of it. And we really yeah. feel strongly about what I mentioned earlier. Really, once we, you know, nail it, um, you know, the workflows and the pain points and those sort of things, using it to to optimize it and take it to the next level, especially now, right? Where there's this like to to your point, right? AI for for XYZ and um and you might build something, but it's so sort of fragmented or outside of the workflow that it doesn't even have a chance, right? Especially in our space where there's a thousand and one sales tools um, yep. and that make a lot of sense, but adoption is one of the biggest keys. Speaking of adoption and customer discovery, customer development, 
any tips like that you would give founders out there uh, or those early sales people um, around doing that properly or even doing it in general? It's baffling to me when I talk to some folks and they're like, yeah, you know, we talked to a handful of people, five, five people or whatever. And they, they think that that's enough to go out there and, and start to build a product, which, Hey, maybe it is right. I, I'm not sure yeah. in my experience, it's a lot more than that. It's continuing to, to go. And it's not just about, okay, can you like get a meeting with a sales rep or, or sales manager? And they go, Oh yeah, that's cool. Yeah. I, I, I think that, you know, makes sense, but getting to them to the point where they'll actually use the tool yep. and actually use the tool enough to buy and then actually use the tool enough to not churn at the yep. end of the, the subscription or if you're on a monthly, right, churn very quickly. Any yep. tips around that that you found? Yeah, totally. So I, I think that um, I would say just like about discovery, uh, I think that's like the most important skill set to have as a salesperson and as a founder. I was just talking with my co-founder about this earlier today and and kind of trying to go back to the basics of the mom test, which is if founders especially have not read this book, it's, it's the best book I would recommend in uh, on the topic of customer discovery, um, which is basically just this concept of like, if you ask your mom, if your startup is a good idea, she doesn't want to hurt your feelings. She's going to say, yes, that's a great idea, son. Uh, but really what you want is you want to not ask leading questions. You don't want to ask people that are just going to be nice to you. You want to ask people how they've tried to solve this problem before. Have they tried to buy a solution? get them to talk about the pain. And then eventually, maybe you tell them what your solution is. Um, I think that's very relevant. I, I've got a sticky note on my computer right now that that uh, is discovery questions uh, from Chris Orlob, who puts out a bunch of good content around discovery. Um, I'm for my own sales process, like I, I'm continually trying to go back to what are the most basic discovery questions that I can be asking. Um, and ultimately trying to understand the pain and pull out information from the prospect um, or the customer of, you know, what is the pain that you're actually experiencing? Is it a hair on fire pain or not? Um, and I've also seen that um, this is particularly important for a sales rep that's selling at a PLG company. So when you're doing product-led sales, you have to understand the data. So that's what that company or what that person has already done in your product. So have they integrated certain services? If yes, that tells you a certain story, right? So you can go in with that assumption and validate that. Who else has signed up at the company? You know, are there a bunch of people in marketing and you're selling at Airtable? Okay, probably tells you that like there's some sort of initiative at marketing and, you know, there's 13 people that signed up last week in the marketing department. Try to understand that better. Um, and then... Again, being a product expert, right? So in a PLG world, somebody might be using Airtable for six months um, and they're not paying you a dollar yet. You need to understand in conversations, not just in the data, but also anecdotal um, information and, and understanding you know, why they are signing up and using Airtable um, and try to pull out that information in that discovery process. So learning from end users is super important. Learning from you know, what is the executive? So that, that might be like an individual contributor. Then you're going to package that up and sell that and have a narrative that you're presenting to an executive in that sales process. Um, so I do think that, um, yeah, as a, as a founder in building products, this discovery is super important. Um, I think also as a salesperson, particularly at a product-led sales motion company, it's super important to have really, really good, deep discovery um, to be able to to ultimately guide your prospect um, where they need to go. Do you have any sort of tips around when you're at zero, right? Mm -hmm. And you're, you're having to now launch because it feels like customer discovery, top of the funnel, feels like top of the funnel, right? It's something that sales focused on. But as founders, we need to then take it all the way through like customer success too, right? Yep. Like any, any sort of tips around that, taking them through those steps, but then also like actually making sure that those 
uh, initial users are successful so they convert to paying customers and that they're paying something that's sustainable which is mm-hmm. so hard right like pricing changes a thousand times and yeah. to figure out what actually works long term is very difficult yep yeah I, I think it's it's um as a founder it's crucial to to see that process all the way through you know again going back to the montes it's like you know would you buy the solution yes uh that's like the classic thing not to do cool, buy it. Even when they do buy it, like you said, are they adopting it, right? Even once they've signed up and they've onboarded, have they adopted it? Are they using it? Are they happy with it? Are they running into any blockers? Do they have any features that are tangential that they want? Um, I think that is like the feedback loop of that should dictate your product roadmap, which dictates then your sales process, right? So this is just a continuous flywheel forever, right? Like I, I think... Um, if we're around in 12 years, hopefully I'm still doing that exact process of sitting very closely with customers, gathering feedback from them, and then feeding that back into the top of the, the flywheel, if you will, which is going to help um, dictate the, the product roadmap and the direction of the company ultimately. Um, so I think it's, you know, not, this is not a nice to have, this is a need to have um, role uh, as a founder. And Again, kind of drawing the analogy back to um, product-led sales, actually, you know, it's super important to see that full life cycle through. I think one hot take I have is that like the the SDR function, I think is going to dwindle because I think the AE role is going to expand and mm-hmm. start owning more prospecting. It's going to be more of this full sales cycle of prospecting and closing deals. Um, I think AI powered tools are going to be one of the reasons um, for this shift. I think the inefficiency in prospecting, the growth at all cost model that is now behind us, um, this is another factor um, for this. I also would go as far as to say, I think we're going to see, at least in the the SMB and mid-market, we're going to see reps that not only prospect and close deals, but they also maintain those relationships. Uh, And so, especially in a PLG world, you you might close a deal for 500 bucks a month, but the potential deal size is $5,000 a month. I think that there's a world where an account executive actually owns that relationship for three, six, nine months and is actually the one to upsell them that 10X upsell over time. And it's worth them managing that relationship for nine months effectively as mm-hmm. just a sales cycle that happened to have a, a you know a payment for 500 bucks a month for the first nine months of that existence, that, that customer's existence. So- I think that's going to happen. I think the lines between sales and customer success is going to blur in the next five years. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think not only is it important to, to be able to get that customer feedback and feed it back into the product um, and obviously serve your customers as well. Um, I think it's also just going to blur as we go forward where, you know, the line between, is it a customer or paying customer? How much are they paying? Like, this is all just going to kind of blur, especially at PLG companies. Awesome. Brendan, thank you so much for taking the time to chat and talk shop here today. Uh, this is super helpful. If if folks want to follow you on social media or learn more about Groundswell or maybe even use it, maybe we can start out with like what types of folks out there, personas or company types would be uh, benefit or could benefit from using Groundswell. Yeah, so, so right now we're focused on any... B2B SaaS company that has a bottoms up motion. So you can sign up and start using the product on their website and they have a sales team. So they have at least a couple of reps. Um, if, if that's you, you're probably thinking about people that are signing up and how do I reach out to those people in a more effective way? Um, how do I understand that data? Um, those are the types of companies that we're working with today. And then we're starting to, in the the next couple of months, we'll start expanding into looking at signals, not just from product data, but also from your CRM. So we'll we'll start with Salesforce and HubSpot, and we'll start kind of finding data within your existing CRM. You don't have to buy any more data. We're just going to be sweeping your CRM to find interesting leads um, for you to go after. So um, yeah, in the next next month or so, uh, if you're a a PLG company that also has a sales team. So product-led sales, um, 
yeah, come check us out. Try groundswell.com is the best place. We got some videos on there. So you can just look at the product. Ironically, we're not PLG ourselves, um, which we didn't get into, but for another conversation. Um, and then, yeah, if you want to reach out to me, connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, and uh, yeah, shoot me a message. Always fun to jam with people. Awesome, brother. Well, have a wonderful, wonderful day. And Thank I got to come out to Austin again and check you out. Come on, man. We'll grab some tacos. Great to catch awesome. up. Have a great day. All right.